Welcome back, friends. Thanks for being here. Fasten your seatbelts and subscribe, because it's going to be fun. I got a big old box of parts here that I need to put together to start out with. First off, it's an extreme close-up. To start out with, got a new camera angle. We've got some more lights. Here's the board in question. This is an ISA board. And oddly enough, it's going to have a 16-bit card edge connector. And I'm only going to run an 8-bit processor on it. And you can see from the silk screen, I got a whole lot of stuff to be putting on here. All that stuff is in this box. And so what we need to do is start going through here and figuring out what the big components are, what the little components are, and what order we're going to put this stuff in. So I've got chips and chip sockets. I've got, oh, that's, that's hard to see, clock crystals. That's going to be tiny. More chip sockets, more chip sockets. Oh, chips. I don't know. That looks like it is a pin header for DuPont wires. More chip sockets. Tantalum capacitors. And there are 46 of them in this bag. Ooh, don't you wish you were me right now. These are Octal Trans D Type TI latches. So, more chips. That's a box. Dual 4 input logic gates. More chips. What do we got here? Hey, more chips, but you weren't expecting that. A resistor. A resistor pack. A resistor. I've got to do a better job of ordering these parts in bigger quantities, so I've got some on hand. But then i got to figure out how to store them, and that's going to be fun, too. More chip sockets. Quad 2 input logic gates, triple 3 input logic gates. How do you have a quad 2 input and a triple 3 input? And there's another one in here that's a quad, a dual 4 input. We'll learn and figure that out as we go. Chips. Fragile. Handle with care. Huh. Audio speaker and transducer. That's a right angle momentary switch. Another single resistor. Bipolar junction transistors. Yep, that's a transistor, all right. Oh, that's pretty. That's a big old box of, wait for it, chip sockets. Integrated real-time clock. Circular DIN connectors. There's a lot of stuff that's all about the same size there. Dip switches. Another capacitor. So dip switches are pretty cool. I started out a long time ago in computers, and they were just always dip switches to me, and usually you hit them with a pen and you get ink all over them. But I never knew, until I started getting into the electronics side of things, that they're called dips because they're dual inline packages, just like dip chips are and dip sockets are. And you're just closing off um, switches underneath of it. Fairly obvious, but if you never think about it, you never think about it. Hmm. I ordered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sockets. And this is a one, two, three, four, five by five, a 10 pack. So I actually paid somebody to open up this 10 pack of chip sockets and pull three of them out and ship it to me. Live and learn. Sip resistors, another chip, another set of resistors. A right angle mount dual LED. More resistors. Chips. Chips. I'd say cheap as chips, but this is pretty expensive buying them this way. Chips. These are diodes. Battery holder. I can go in the chip select pile. Uh -huh. Chip select. Get it? fancy packaging for a six pin resistor. This is supposed to be a SIP resistor, but they wrapped it in bubble wrap and put it in a big bag. Clock crystal, chips. Yeah, I know, they're probably about the same height. I'm not gonna sweat the details too much. More chips. More chips. 
more chips, more chips, more chips. All right, well, we got a little tiny pile of stuff over here, an even smaller pile of stuff in the middle, and a great big pile of stuff over here for all the chips and chip sockets. So we're going to do the chips and chip sockets last. Let's get those put away. I guess I don't have to be too gentle because these are all wrapped in bubble wrap and individual bags and foam packing material and all that jazz. That box out of the way. Oh, chip socket. How'd that get in there? That don't belong there. Resistor and chips. Okay. Yeah. So that narrows it down to a bunch of smaller parts. Let's get the soldering iron turned on and warmed up. I'm gonna get a suntan from these lights. All right, in my last project, it was a small board with a big ground plane, and I needed to turn my soldering iron up to 740 to get it to work. So now I'm going to turn it back down to 640, which is where I like it. Maybe you like it somewhere else. Let me know below if you uh, think that's a good number or a bad number. 640 in Fahrenheit, obviously. 640 in Celsius. That'd be kind of ridiculous. I'd just melt the board. Okay. So I ordered these from Mauser. If you guys have ordered from Mauser before, you're familiar with the packaging. And the cool thing about Mauser is, is that they write on the package what it is. So these diodes are 100 volt, 200 milliamp, general purpose, power switching, ON semi diodes. So I can leave these in their bags and walk down my bill of materials checklist and whatnot and figure out where they go and work my way through. And I think, because there's so many of them, I'm just going to start with these tantalum capacitors. And the good thing about tantalum capacitors is they don't really have any orientation. Let's move that over there. Look at our parts list. 46 capacitors, and they are C1 through C46 on the board. Let's get the board back here and see if we can find... It should be fairly easy to find 46 capacitors listed on the board. And it looks like there is a capacitor at just about every single chip here on the board. Remember all those sockets where each one of those sockets gets a chip? Or, sorry, remember all those sockets and chips I got? Each one of those goes on the board. And since each one of those gets a capacitor, we've got about 46 sockets and chips to solder onto this board too. All right. So this is part of the XI8088 kit from Sergei Kisilev. Links will be down below to the boards. From my previous video, you saw that I built the main motherboard for all this stuff to go in. And Sergey made this back in 2011, and I was hoping that he'd also have maybe a 286 or a 386 SX card to go along with this. It would fit up, made up pretty well with the 16-bit bus. And it uh, would be a cool little thing to play with, to have all of the boards in the series put together. I did not order the main processor or the math co-processor for this. I'm going to order the math co-processor just because I want to, not because it's really needed for any of the things that I'm going to be doing with this machine. But my original 8088 did not have a math co-processor, so I want one. And then I think I'm going to go with a V20, or maybe... I think this board also supports a V30. I'd have to check out to see if it supports a V30 or not. Um, and try and max this out. I started out with an 8088 running at 10 megahertz, so I can't, I can't do an 88 running at 10 megahertz. I already know what that's all about. I want something new and fresh. All right, stop talking, start soldering. Yeah, I know, I know. So I've got a regular chisel tip on here, nothing special. My solder came out of my solder feeding device. Can't really tell if I like this thing or don't like this thing. I like it because it's neat and it puts the solder in a good place and puts it away, but uh, not the biggest fan overall, just because of how cheap it was, like I mentioned in the previous video. Let's see if I can find C1. Start at the very beginning, right? And I'm sure there's some order as to how these guys go, but I don't see it. So, for example, that is C2, and that is C39, right next to it. So, not as easy as just looking at the board and going one at a time. Well, these are in the hundreds. C110, C130. Eh, C130. That's funny. There it is, C1. I'm working on another project where the pin layout on the board is tighter than the standard packaging that you get with the parts. These have any writing on them at all? Oh, too small for my eyes. Let me 
get out my, uh, my little cheaters there and see if there's anything written on it. Oh, there is. And they wrote it in light green on blue. That's helpful. C2. I stole these ramekins from my wife to put all my small parts in. I'm glad she bought those for me. C3. And what I'm doing now is I'm putting in the individual capacitors and on the back side of the board. I don't know if I can get that in there to a way that you're going to see it. Mm, probably not. I don't know. I can't even see it. Yep. Anyway, I tried. Anyway, I'm putting them in and then I'm spreading the legs on the back side and that holds them from falling out and gives them a little bit of orientation. And that way I can put all of these guys in and uh, then go about soldering them. I might not put them all in, but I'll put most of them in if I don't put all of them in. Depends on how busy the back of the board gets. I don't want a rat's nest to solder legs on the back side of this thing that I've got to navigate around. And I am probably going to get one of these in backwards anyway. But I'll give it my best shot to get them all in the same orientation. Not that anybody's going to be able to look in here and read these things, but I'll know that I did it right. Or at least I attempted to did it right. See what I did there? And then we'll uh, speed up the rest of this so that you guys don't have to watch me figure out where all these guys go. Okay, so I lied. Those ones earlier that I said were C110 and C120, it's actually C11 0.1 .1 microfarads, and it's just run together on the board. So I looked everywhere for those, and uh, then I came to the conclusion that it was just part of the way the silk screen was written. So I found instead of trying to turn it over in my hand, that if I put it in the board first and then take a look at it, I can tell that it's held in place and I can turn it around. Because these are pretty tiny. Always learning something new. So I really like the way this guy designed this board. I've been working on another project in some of my other videos where the board design is not as elegant as this. And, uh... First off, everything's nice and neat and in rows and organized. And he's got a nice bill of materials and so on to work from. But what I just noticed is that the chips and the chip sockets are labeled. So this is is a chip U22 and this is capacitor C22. So that's a pretty nice thing. I'm sure these are numbered in the order they're numbered in for a specific reason, which I don't know yet. And that reason would tell me why they're not right next to each other in rows and columns in numerical order, but we'll get there. So, I mean, that was 22 down there, that's 23, that's 26. You can probably go crazy with adding multiple layers to the board and get them closer to each other. And of course, that makes the board more expensive. And I don't want to go just putting capacitors in the holes that are next to the chips, because I want to make sure that I get them all. And I also want to make sure I get them all in the right sockets. In the right holes, I guess. These aren't the old socket capacitors, you know what I mean. down to the wire, only 10 left. Aren't you glad I sped this up for you? You'd think it'd get easier when there's fewer of them to deal with. Maybe another way to do this would have been to make a checkbox list of each, you know, 1 through 46, and then just populated them and then checked them off as I went. Instead of doing it in order, just do it in the order they show up on the board, top to bottom, left to right. I don't know, if you have a better idea, let me know below in the comments. Alright, they are all in. Let's double check the orientation. Watch some old timer come by and tell me that I put them all in in the wrong direction anyway. They all match, but they're all backwards. The way we did it back in my day was we put them all in right to left instead of left to right. You laugh, but that happened. I did that with my resistors. I made sure I put them all in. My, my first kit I ever built, I just put them in. Who cares? Didn't know any better. And then the next kit that I built, I tried to put all the resistors in in some type of logical order, and uh, they were all in upside down. Alright, this is very ugly and not working. Alright, well, you guys don't have to watch me solder in 46 capacitors, so I'm going to pause the video here, and then we will come back when we're all done with that. Alright, and we are back. Aren't you glad I didn't make you sit through soldering 
46 capacitors. You know, the only thing worse than soldering 46 capacitors is cutting 46 capacitors. But they're all done. I went through and after they were all soldered, I went through and wiggled them all to figure out which ones were soldered well and not soldered well, and then uh, touched up the ones that were not soldered well. And then I went through and clipped off all the legs, and then I went through with a magnifying glass and checked every single one out, and they all look pretty good. So, on to the resistors. Okay, so I didn't really like the last camera angle all that much. And we're going to try a different camera angle this time and see if this works out any better. So we got all the capacitors installed, now I need to install, oh, wait for it, more capacitors. I need 10 microfarad ceramic and I need a quantity of 5 of those. So let's see if we've got a, a dime bag, should I say that? Nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? No, I don't. Well, let's go through our big box of parts. I thought those were all chips and chip sockets. But apparently, they weren't all chips and chip sockets. Chip sockets. Headers. Chip sockets. The chip. More chip sockets. More chip sockets. Chips. Chips. Chips, chips, chip sockets, chips, chip sockets, PS2 keyboard port, tip switches, real time clock, like a kid in Christmas, logic gates, more chip sockets, fragile, handle with care. Yeah, and that's a speaker. Inverters, chip sockets, chip sockets, chips, chips, battery holders, logic gates, sockets, chips, chips. Logic gates, and that's it. Well, I guess in this great big huge order, either they didn't send it to me or I didn't order it. I will take full responsibility for it and I will order some more. But don't think that's the end of this because there's plenty more stuff to solder on here. I've never seen any other capacitors in this stack of stuff. Diodes, resistors, Crystals, resistor, crystal, resistor, SIP resistor, resistor, push button switch, resistor, forgot what that's called, capacitor, there's a capacitor, SIP resistor, resistor, LEDs, another SIP resistor, I don't know why that one's in bubble wrap. Transistor, that's the word I was looking for for that thing. I think this one's labeled wrong. It says this is a resettable fuse, but if you look at it, it looks more like a capacitor to me. I don't know. Cross that bridge when we get there. All right, let's go down to resistors in our bill of materials. Nope, diodes came first. These are 100 volt IO, 200 milliamp. Maybe these aren't the diodes I'm looking for. All right, we'll just go straight down to resistors. This is the fun of putting one of these parts kits together, is there's so many parts. I just don't know where to begin. So right now I'm looking for a 100 kilo ohm resistor. Quarter watt. One kilo ohm resistor. That's not what I'm looking for, I'm looking for 100 kilo ohms. 10 kilo ohms. Getting closer, only one more zero to go. 33, 100 kilo ohms. All right, that's the one, and it is R1. Might as well start at the very beginning, right? Now to find R1 on the board. 
All right, there it is. Did not like the way I pulled that through. All right. Maybe I'll turn the board around and bring the board to the solder instead of the solder to the board. And I think that I got a little overzealous in cutting those legs off of the capacitors and cut them a little too close. So I'm going to cut them not so close this time. All right, R2, R4, R5, or 470, and that would be these guys. R3, R4, R5, get a little tight in this area. Need R2, R7, R6. Anyway, let's put in the one that we know where they are, which is R4 and R5, and then we'll go find R2. Yeah, this one's tight just like the last one was tight. We'll try a different trick with the next one. So what I have done in the past is bend these over the edge of the board, and I think that's still going to be too wide. So, got to get used to this new camera setup. I'm doing too much stuff off camera. There's really no good place to put a camera for a project like this. It's either you're looking at the back of my shoulder, or you're too far away, or you're too close. So that's why I'm trying different camera angles. Let's see if we can find a winner. The thing I've seen other people do is put the camera between them and what they're working on. And what you hear them talk about the entire time they're working is that the camera's in the way. And if I was to do that, the camera would basically be right in my lap. All right, now I need to do R2 still. So we gotta find R2. R3, R7, diode, there's R2. That's not too bad. Three is a 10 kilo ohm quarter watt. And I think we already passed that by in the stack. And there she is. R3. Okay. These are a little tighter than your normal spacing. I'm trying to cram a lot of stuff onto this board. This isn't the tightest board I've seen still, so I'm not really complaining, I'm just uh, talking out loud. This board's made by Sergei Kisilev, who also made the backplane board and all the rest of the boards I'll be putting together so far in this series. There's a couple of other uh, boards that I'll probably wind up getting to from some other manufacturers a little later down the line, like the uh, XT-IDE adapter. Seems like another perfect fit for this project. Overall, I think he's done a pretty good job. Um, he's just spacing these really tight, so you can't just bend them over by hand. You've got to bend them over really, really close to the end of the resistor. And I need R6, which is a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Three kilo ohm resistor. I think that's back in the pack in the other direction. Yep. Oh, threw that one right off the table. R7. There it is. Five hundred and ten ohm resistor. That's kind of an interesting flavor. Two of them. I don't remember running into them. Nope, I did. I got them. I guess I still need to clip those legs. I didn't do that yet. All right, R8 and R9. The way this board is silkscreen, you could almost just look at the board and order all the parts off of it. That's pretty good. I am not seeing these guys. Feel free to speak up and tell me where they are. Oh wait, there's a note. Install only using NMOS type of U1 for CMOS 82C84. Install C52 and C53 instead. So they might go in the C52 and C53 spots. 
which are right here, and it also says R8 or R9 on the opposite side. Yep, that's where those go. So I'm going to put those aside and move on to the next one. And when I get to that A2C84, then we'll revisit putting in one or the other of those guys. RR1 and RR3 are 10 pin, 10 kilo ohm resistors. Those are 6 pin, those are 10 pin. And RR1, RR2, RR3. And these guys have, can we even get in close enough on that? Yeah, see that little white dot there? They have a little white dot on them. And on the board, there is a corresponding white square on the edge where that goes. So there's two, one, and I need number three. And there's number three. And those are all going to fall out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do them one at a time. Put a little bit of solder on the tip. Use that to put a little bit of solder on the board. Verify that it looks the way you think it should look. And then we'll do all the rest of them. My solder spool is stuck. That's going to come back and bite me again in the future, but we'll be ready for it. Solder is no match for me. Okay. And that looks good, so we'll get them all done. So there's a couple of different ways to solder in pieces like this. And what I have found works pretty well is to hold the piece in place with one hand <coughs> and put a little solder on the tip of the soldering iron maybe a little bit more than you would just to tin the tip, maybe about twice as much, and then solder that one pin in place and use that to hold it in place. We'll see if that works out with the chip sockets later on when we get to doing chip sockets. But uh, another way to do it would be to remember where it goes, because I just lost it over here. Another way to do it would be to take a little piece of tape, tape it in place where you want it like that, and i got to find it when I flip the board over. See, the problem I just ran into is that it's kind of diagonal. So that's why I don't like doing that. So if you can see that on the board, it's kind of nasty and diagonal. So then what you can do to fix that, since I only soldered one pin, hold the whole thing in place and reheat that one pin. A little bit more solder on there to help with heat transfer. There we go. Reheat that one pin and shove it through again. And now it's at an angle. See if you can see that. It's not straight up and down. I mean, it's fine, but it's not straight up and down, so straighten it out a little bit. There we go. Take pride in your work, otherwise, what's the point? Oh, there's some solder. Getting short. All right, let's check over those three that we did, make sure they're all soldered in well. Looks pretty good to me. So we'll mark those off. And now I need two 10k ohm 6 pin resistors, which are these guys here. And they're going in 4 and 5. There's number 4. My solder spool is going in all different kinds of directions. Now I've got three ends coming off of it. Sometimes these things happen. I like that trick better than the tape trick. All right, now we're down to two ends that I know of. Making progress all the time. Let's put a little extra solder on that first pin, because we can. That was R4, now I need R5. Get some solder on that tip. All right, that looks good. All right, there's four and five. And then now we get to find out why this one is wrapped in bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. I'm guessing somebody just got excited at the packing plant. Man, I can't say that I blame them. This is really exciting stuff to be doing. This is RR6. Four and five and six. Hmm. Now I'm just being stubborn. I'm going to see if I can get this done in this configuration. Let's 
does that look? Looks pretty good. All right, does look good. Check them off. Okay, what do we have here? That's the LED light. That's actually going to be pretty tall. So we'll save that one for later. These are diodes. Where are the diodes? Okay, this is... Why did I get two of those? Let's see if there's more than one. One and four, one, four, eight. No, I ordered two. There's only one in there. Okay then. One and four one four eight. I don't know why I ordered two of those, but I ordered two of them. All right, diodes are only good in one direction, and so there is. Can we see it? It's a black stripe on the diode, and there is corresponding stripe on the board. A whole bunch of stuff there. Hopefully, you guys can see that. Line the stripes up. Super complicated stuff. There we go. And that's just going to disappear on the board. You won't even be able to see it. And one of the solder mask is round, and one of the solder mask is square. So that's another giveaway. And then if you can't figure it out from those two clues, or those two clues don't exist, you can get out your DVM and figure out where it's supposed to go. Okay. We have, we have a switch. Let's do this small crystal. That's not the crystal. There's another crystal on here somewhere. All right, that's the one, and it goes in slot X1. All right, let's find X1 on the board. All right, there's X1. And I want to get in quick and solder this and get out. All right, I got that, got both of them done. Let's check it. Nice and flush with the board, looks good. And I don't need to add any more solder. Those both look pretty good. All right, and we have a little tiny crystal. And this is a tuned fork crystal, 32,768 hertz. All right, that's the one, and that goes in X2. All right, let's find X2. There she is. This thing's so tiny. Well, I think that works. Mark that one off. And then we have a transistor. And I think that'll be it for this segment here. Q1. And this was done pretty nicely in that the silk screen on the board has the shape, you can see it right there by my thumbnail, has the shape of the transistor. So I can just slip it right into place. Pretty solid to me. Let's save that capacitor for later. This is a switch. Let's figure out where this switch goes on the board. The switch goes on SW1. What a shock. we will do one pin and then we will check our work. All right, looks good. And this pin has a lot of human, this pin, this switch has a lot of human interaction with it. So there's actually a couple of extra big solder holes here and they want you to put a lot of solder into it and that's gonna make a good mechanical connection. So don't be afraid to put a lot of solder in the hole. And even with all that solder that you saw me put in there, it still didn't even 
come out of the top side of the board. It's quite a lot on the back side, but didn't come too much out of the top side. And that is your reset switch. So making a little bit more progress. I think it's time for sockets. Let's grab the first sleeve of sockets and see what we can do with these guys. Good thing about sockets is they only go in one way and they are typically just the right size. Like obviously this one here has an extra pin or two that's not, uh, well, not so obviously. The silk screen's bigger than the socket is. That one's too small. So I ordered the exact right amount of sockets instead of having any extras or not and uh, should make it fairly easy to Put them in. These are 40 pin dip sockets and the way to put sockets in, I'm sure you guys all know this, but there is a notch on the end of the socket for pin one and on the silk screen of the board there's a corresponding notch and if you look really closely on actual pin one the solder mask is square instead of round. So there you go. And like we said last time, there's a couple of different ways you can do these. You can tape them in place or you can um, do what I'm going to do, which is solder in one pin and then make some adjustments and see what happens. So this is the socket for the 8087 math coprocessor. This is the socket for the 8088, the main CPU. This is the 8237 and this is the 8242, which is your keyboard controller. Let's start with the 8242. Start by getting our solder out. And where we left off last time was the solder all came off of the solder reel. So now I need to find an end on my solder reel. Okay. And I have been trying it coming under on the reel instead of over on the reel to see which one I think works better for me. It's kind of like the over-under on the toilet paper debate. Honestly, at the end of the day, I think it really doesn't matter. But if you want a deciding factor, if you have pets that like to play with the toilet paper, because they think it's fun to unwind the whole thing, have it come under instead of over, and it won't be very fun for very long, because it'll just roll around. It won't actually come off at all. But if you don't have any pets, then it really just doesn't matter. Okay, that's in. I think that socket looks pretty good. Grab one of my solderlings and get the rest of these pins on. Still looks good. It's better to check as you go along a little bit if you've got any concerns than it is to get the whole thing soldered into place and find out that you did it wrong. Because this has got 40 pins and getting them all to be free all at the same time so you can adjust the mess that you made is pretty darn close to impossible. So what you wind up doing is desoldering the whole socket which unless you have a desoldering iron, which I don't currently have, I am accepting gifts, however. Uh, that's a real pain to desolder with one of those uh, solder sucker devices or a soldering iron with a squeeze bulb on it. I had to do some desoldering of single row header sockets and single row pin headers in another project. And what I wound up doing was disassembling the pin header or the socket from the pins. And that made it so that I could so my memory card ran out of space just in the middle of a riveting story about removing pin headers and sockets and all that stuff. So what I was saying was I disassembled the pieces of plastic from the pin headers and then pulled the pins out one at a time and then put the pin headers back together and then soldered them back in in the right orientation that they were supposed to be. One thing I have learned about soldering in, yep, there it is, multiple, multiple pins like this, is it's actually really easy to miss one. And maybe it's one of those things where I put everything together and all the solder goes onto the tip instead of going on to the project. 
So I'm going to do a real quick check after I'm done to make sure that every pin is soldered and every pin has a nice joint on it. And I try to look at it from a couple of different angles to make sure under a magnifying glass and all that jazz. Because it's really hard to troubleshoot something that isn't working when you uh, have missed one pin. So line up the pin one marker with the pin one marker on the board. Get some solder on my soldering iron. Get one pin to stick. See if we like it. And this time I've checked it. It's lined up on the board pretty well. I'm going to solder an opposite pin there. Now that's not going anywhere. And we can solder all the rest of them. Solder keeps backing off of the reel and then wrapping around the axle. Let's check all these out. Make sure these are good. And all of them except for pin number one looked pretty good. So I'm going to add some more solder to pin number one, which now has a huge blob of solder on it. So that worked out really well. Oh, that was yucky. It just slipped right off the pin and slid it right across the board. And the solder cooled along the way. That was pretty interesting. Next. Alright, my pin ones are lined up. Get some extra solder on the uh, tip there. There we go. See how I like that? It looks pretty good. And the solder's wrapped around the axle again. So I'm going to go with over the top and see if that fixes that any or not. How do you know you don't like something until you try it, right? I'll just be the optimist and say, oh look, it's better already. Or does that fall under the uh, don't count your chickens before they hatch situation? I learned something new about swans today I thought was pretty interesting and enlightening. So swans mate for life, but something like 16% of all swan mate for life encounters end in divorce. I've always heard of, you know, birds mating for life and so on, but I've never heard of birds getting divorced. Am I going to change this channel to uh, soldering and unrelated facts? Stay tuned for more. Just wait and see. All right, check my work. Looks good. Put in the next socket. So when I was working on these machines in my earlier days, I never had a Mathco processor, the 8087. It was always an option. It never came with the machine direct from the places I get them from. And then eventually you find one in a scrap pile somewhere. You always want it. It's really expensive. You have no idea. I mean, I know what a math coprocessor does. It helps with floating, floating point arithmetic. But you don't really have that much of a need for it, unless you're doing some high-end CAD work, which I did get into later on, and I did have machines that had them. But now, an 8087 math coprocessor has got to be, you know, in the, in the two-digit price range. So I'm kind of debating whether I want to put it in or not. And I'm also debating... I think I've already got the clocks set up for 10 megahertz. But I'm debating whether I'm going to get a uh, V20, V30... I think the V30 is still compatible, I'm not 100% sure. The NEC V20 was a pin compatible, instruction compatible variant of the 8088 processor in the day, but it was actually faster, you know, clock cycle for clock cycle, it was actually faster than the Intel chip. And I had an Intel 8088, so I doubt I'll notice any difference. No matter what I run on these machines, it's going to be slow just by its nature, but I might do it just for fun, as much fun as swapping one CPU chip for another CPU chip that's slightly faster can be. I mean, hold on to the edge of your seats, guys. And this project's all going somewhere. I'm actually going to be able to do some screen capturing of DOS programs and early versions of Windows that would actually run on this kind of hardware. And hopefully somebody will make a uh, 286 board for this kind of system or a 386SX type of board. I think anything bigger than a 386SX, you're probably going to be overpowering the bus. But I bet if you got a 386 DX board and a uh, 
good amount of cache RAM and system RAM on the card itself, it would be okay. All right, inspect that last socket. And it's funny how you can do this and think you got all of them, and you can inspect them and think you got all of them, and still find out later on that you didn't got all of them. Let's get this checked off on the parts list. I don't even know where these are on the parts list. I just grabbed sockets and started putting them in. Capacitor, diode, fuse, connector, transistor, resistor, resistor array, speaker, switch, switch, IC, 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 crystal oscillator, IC socket. So the ICs come in the parts list before the IC sockets come in the parts list. And U2, U3, U7, and U9. So, got them all. All right. Next set of sockets. This would actually make a neat little parts tray for doing parts work down the road. Or I'll just wind up putting that in a box with other things that I think are neat, neat parts trays for doing neat parts down the road. I'm going to put all these sockets on the workbench in the right orientation and have that orientation match the orientation that the board is set up as. And that way I can't get them wrong. So these are the 74 series logic chip sockets. And that doesn't fit because it's actually too big for that socket. I thought it wasn't fitting because the capacitor was in the way. And right now I'm just familiarizing myself with where they go. And making sure that I have the right amount. What's wrong with that one? There's a little bit of solder in that socket, probably from my earlier drag and drop exercise. Eh. I just pop the pin out of the socket. That's okay. Lots of ways to get that back in there. All right. So we've got them all. You know where they all go roughly? Let's get them back out, and then we'll. Pick that one with the hole to solder in first, with the blocked hole to solder in first. All right. Make sure it's got the right orientation. Make sure it's sitting flush, and then get them all done. These only have 20 pins on them, so these will obviously be twice as fast. However, there's twice as many of them. You can already see I don't like this one, this one solder joint. So we'll put some more solder on that first one, and then we'll go in and check them all. All right, they all look pretty good. We've had some interesting weather so far this year. Yesterday it was 75 and sunny, and today it is 46 and not sunny. So these are great projects to do when the weather's not so great outside. Missed one. Got a little ahead of myself on that one. But I 
was able to get it fixed, so that's good. I feel the heat come right through on that pin. Hopefully the idea that you're getting from watching me solder this in is that this isn't something that uh, is so terribly hard that you couldn't do it yourself. And if you do decide to give it a try and you have any questions, feel free to drop me a line and ask. I never thought that I would be doing anything like this, but here I am. I mean, it's kind of cliche, but if I can do it, so can you. And there's more than one way to do all of this stuff you might actually find a way that's better than what I'm doing. And I am by no means an expert on any of this stuff myself, so. Some little attention to detail things on this board that I think make it a really good product. Having all of the sockets all line up in the same direction, I think is a pretty nice thing. And this one, I bent one of the pins on the socket itself. So that's why it's having fun going into place there. The SIPS resistors that are on the other side of the board next to the socket are actually taller than the socket. So should I have put the socket in first and then the SIP resistors or the SIP resistors and then the socket? It's just easier if you put the smaller components in, the shorter components in first, and then the taller components. But it's not a rule, you can do it any way you want. Alright, that one's in. And this is the last of those flavor of sockets. too much solder on that one. If you wind up with too much solder, all you have to do is get your soldering iron in there and kind of warm it up into a pool and then just wipe away from the, the pin in question. Alright, those all look good. Let's get them marked off. U4, U15 through U23 are 20 pin dip sockets. 23, 21, 4, 19, 15, 17, 18, 20, 16, 22, 17. Well, there's probably a reason why they don't go in order, and that's okay. All right. Next group of sockets coming right up. Okay, so I did a little bit of housekeeping, and I got out the next set of sockets, and there are 16 of these guys, so I'm gonna use the other trick where you put them in place and you tape them in and double check them all before you flip the board over and solder them all in place. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solder one of the pins on each one of these in place and then I'm gonna flip it over and take the tape off and laugh as I realize I missed one of them and fix it. And this, this method works out pretty well because all of the sockets are real close to each other. They're all on the same side of the board. They're all the same size. So nothing says you can't use different techniques at the same time on the same board. And I still can't decide whether I like this solder spool idea or not. I guess overall it's not bad. Yeah, see right there the board's lopsided in one direction. And so that uh, one chip wasn't hanging out just right. Gotta go by feel <laughs> to figure out where these sockets actually are that need to be soldered. We might have missed one joint there. Take care of that while we're here. Alright, I got those three. Yep, that one's up a little high, we'll fix that one. 
Yeah, they're all a little unhappy, but that's okay. All you need to do is reflow the solder a bit. Hold it in place while the solder cools back off. I don't know if you can hear them snap into place or not. All right, now check them out. Make sure they're all in the right orientation. Make sure they're all sitting nice and flush. And then we'll solder them all down. And my guess, let's well, see, there's 14 of them, so I don't know about that guess. No, there's 16 of them, eight and eight. Yep, so my guess is that these are the RAM sockets. So I wonder, and I'm sure there's a perfectly legitimate reason, but I wonder why Sergey went with 16 RAM chips instead of one large RAM chip that was banked or something along those lines. The design itself isn't a pure 8088 XT flavor design. Those do exist. Uh, PC Retro makes a 8088 kit that would even take the IBM BIOS chips itself. But the backplane for this is an ATX backplane. This thing's got a PS2 keyboard and mouse port. I think it's got a mouse port. I hope it's got a mouse port. But it's okay, because I got a serial mouse, so we'll be fine either way. So it's not a pure design. So we could have very easily gone with a bigger chip that equaled out to 64K of RAM instead of eight smaller chips that equaled out to 64K of RAM. There's something about this one pin here on this socket that I did before. Every time I look at it, it just looks like it hasn't been soldered. This is actually a pretty forgiving thing to do. If you make a mistake, it's easy enough to desolder it. Or as you've seen with putting these sockets in, if they're not in quite straight or aligned the way you like, all you need to do is reflow the solder and fix it. And I just remember building things out of wood when I was younger, and you really can't add wood back after you've cut too much off. I mean, you can, but it depends on the process. So if you're framing out a stud wall and you cut a 2x4 an inch too short, you're really pretty much better off starting over with a new stud. Like this socket here, for example, I don't like the way that it's in. It's kind of a little diagonal. So I'm just reheating the solder on it. I'm trying to get it to be a little less diagonal. Overall, it'll be fine. It's not really a big deal. But it almost looks like it's missing a pin. And it is, because that's the wrong socket for that. Oh, I did that twice. There's two, uh, two sockets in the wrong holes. So we'll get out our desoldering tool and we will take them back off. So I guess I'll stop trying to fix that problem, because I'm actually fixing the wrong problem. Okay. All right, let me get my desoldering tool and I'll be right back. All right, so this is the kind of desoldering tool I was talking about. It's got a little suction bulb here and a regular, well, I wouldn't say regular, it's got a soldering iron tip on it and it's got a little hole in it. And what you do is you wait for it to come up to temperature and this is the old-fashioned kind that doesn't have any type of uh, indicator on it or anything. And so when you think it's ready to try, squeeze the bulb, stick it on, try and melt some stuff, maybe get a little solder on the tip to help with heat transfer. It's just kind of a finicky process. It's not, a, uh, it's not as precise as the other soldering station that I'm using, which is a Hako FX888D, and it's got a uh, temperature readout on it in Fahrenheit and Celsius, and it's got a little stand for it. This is just 
Just your basic soldering iron. It's starting to get warm, it's starting to smell funny. Get in there. There we go. Oh, that's yucky. Clean that off real quick. One down, a little bit of solder left in the hole. I think this is the right tool for that job. There we go. Looks like it's actually still warming up a little bit because it's getting better. Still something holding it in place. It's wanting to come loose, it just isn't coming loose. This really seems to do quite a number on the board. So I'm going to add a little bit of flux and see if that'll help us out with some heat transfer. Hmm. Just set that down on my mat. <laughs> well, that's why you put the mat down. You guys can even see that or not. Yep. I think the Flux worked out pretty well. I think what I need is a little bit of a uh, weight on that socket to help pull it down. And this might be where I run out of hands. See where that pin had just just enough solder on it to hold it in place, but not enough solder on it to be able to heat up very well. All right, let's try some more weight. That soldering iron doesn't make the best contact in the world. It's been uh, well used in its lifetime. So we're going to try the other kind of solder sucker and a regular soldering iron and see if we can get any better.
All right, I'm going to keep at this for a bit, and I'm going to come back when it's done. Okay, so that was a lot of fun, uh, really. I think I might have jinxed myself with all that talk about desoldering stuff earlier in the video. Uh, what I wound up having to do was exactly what I said about desoldering stuff before, which is I wound up having to pull each individual pin out as I desoldered it. And what I did before was I pulled the header off of the pins, leaving the pins behind. I was able to pull the pins out one at a time. In this case, the header is, you know, pretty well solid. So what I was able to do instead was get one pin loose and push it through the socket and get another pin loose and push it through the socket. Because before all of that, what I was doing was I was having trouble keeping track of which ones I had finished and which ones I had not finished. Um, and so I kept unfinishing the ones that I had already finished. So now I'm making sure that all the pins are in the socket all the way. And then I will put them on the board where they actually belong instead of thinking that I was all slick putting them down in a nice straight row. Because what he did when he designed the board was he put two 16-pin sockets here instead of these 14-pin sockets, and I just didn't even see it. So we'll get this guy to go into this socket. And there's only two of these, and they're on opposite sides of the board. So I will do my older trick of soldering in, getting a blob of solder on the tip and soldering in one pin, and then making the adjustment and all that jazz. So there's that. Pull the solder back out. I'm going to put some solder on here and clean my tip real quick. Because as you can see, it's not picking up the solder very well. There we go. And that's because there's actually quite a lot of flux on the on the tip of this thing right now. Okay, so we got one side good. There we go. Alright. Both sides are good right now. So let's see if you can see that. So maybe get some light on it. Oh, look at that. Just so shiny. Okay, enough of that. Some solder on the tip. Solder that one pin in place. Looks good. Double check the orientation is good. Yep. Solder sticking to everything except for this pin, so this pin's probably dirty from the previous job. There we go. Alright, let's get in there and check the work. And this pin's not terribly happy either. Alright. Now the last one. Over here. Those are 2x magnifying glasses. <laughs> so they're great for checking work, but not so good for daily life. Double check that we're happy with that. Yep, pretty good. Alright, let's check these guys out. Happy, happy, happy. Alright, it's starting to look like something. Goes off the list. So what I've got is I've got the bill of materials pulled up in a PDF editor on the laptop and then I just run the highlight tool and highlight it when it gets done. two pins. So it's really hard to see on camera, but there's a number 32 etched right in the notch that indicates where pin 1 should be. So three 32 pin sockets. Let's see if I can find out where those guys are. U11, 12, and 13. So that one's 10, that one's 8. I would have thought they would go right there. So 11, 12, 13. It's those three right there in a row. So we're going to use the tape trick again. Put these guys in. Make sure there's no extra holes that I'm missing. Looks good. Nice piece of tape in there. Flip it over. And we'll put some solder onto pin one, make sure they're anchored a little bit. Take the tape off and check our work. Oh, 
Alright, I think they're all pretty good. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pin showing through the socket there. And so when I double checked, that socket was riding high. So I'm trying to add some heat into it so I can get it to sink into place. And I got four pins in. So I'm going to heat my soldering iron up a little bit. <laughs> and all I'm really doing is pushing those out of the socket instead of fixing the problem, I'm just making another problem. So what I'll do is I'll make a bigger mess and I'll go in and I'll get the other two sockets squared away. And then I'll come back and do that one when these guys are all done. Alright, let's check that one out. Let's go to town. So like I was saying before, you can make mistakes on something like this and you can fix them. And uh, I made a mistake putting that, those two 14 pin sockets in and I was able to get them back out and put them back into the right spot. It's kind of one of the reasons why I got into computers in the first place. You can always kind of check your work as you go along and make sure everything is happy. So now let's get back into fixing this socket up here. I'm actually going to try something different. I'm going to try and add some more solder. fixed and uh, I swiped it with a little bit of solder on the way by. Alright, I'm going to clean up some of that and I'll come right back. Okay, got that out. Now it's time to put it right back in. Some flux left on the board. You can hear it sizzling. And my guess on these sockets is these are for the ROM chips. All right, so far over the bale on the soldering iron, on the soldering iron, on the solder reel holder, has been doing really well. There's a sticker on the reel itself that gets hung up on the axle every so often. But other than that, it's pretty good. So let's check them, make sure we got them all soldered in well, and we'll check them off. All right. Running low on sockets here. 18 pin socket. Where did my trash can go? I moved my trash can. Put that back. 28, 24, U1, 18 pin socket. Got a little bit of a bent pin on it. There we go. Yeah, come on. Alright, that looks good opposite corner. <laughs> Felt that come right through. Let's check all those solder joints, make sure they're good. Maybe add a little more solder to that one. All right. Oscillator full four pin. This one looks like a 14 pin socket, but there's only four pins that are actually connected. And I'm going to need to check the part number on this guy. 774. 46. Ha! That's what I figured. I put another pin in there. Another socket in there. Well, that's going to be fun. Why would you do that? Okay, we're going to do that one later.
That's a header. We'll do headers later. We'll get all the sockets done. All right. Last two sockets. Last two sets of sockets. How are these different? Or did I order them twice by accident? 24 pin, 28 pin. All right. 24s go on 8 and 10, which are these two up here. Let's do number 8 first. All right, that looks good. I'm doing it that way. Alright, that's 8 and 10. And I would imagine, yep, 5 and 6. Trick again. All right, that looks good. Check those ones out. Looking pretty good. All right. Let's uh, take a break. I'm gonna eat some dinner. I gotta cook it first. That's why I gotta take a break. And uh, when I come back, there'll be some more magic. So every so often, you get to the point where you're making more mistakes than you're making progress. And I think it was all the talk about how easy it is to desolder and fix mistakes and clean up after yourself if you accidentally do something wrong or order more parts or whatever. So uh, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. I put a socket there when I should have put a different kind of socket there. So I had to desolder that and solder in a couple of extra ones. So we're going to solder in these last few remaining bits here and then uh, give it a good cleaning and take it from there. So this is the battery holder for the real-time clock and the CMOS. Get that installed. I think that's as close down to the board as it's going to get anyway. Okay. speaker. The speaker's kind of leggy. It's got really long pins on it.
And then I ordered the wrong kind of headers for that. It'll be really hard to put jumpers on that. And if I put it in the proper way, it's going to be even harder to get it into the ISA slot with it blocking some of the pins. So that goes in the parts bin. I got to order some more of those. And then uh, time to start putting in some chips. So watch this space for more chips to come in the future. Okay, so time to put some chips in. First thing I'm going to do since I'm handling chips is put on a ground strap and uh, start putting some chips in. This is a 74 series Logic chip 74ALS139N. So we need to find out where it is. He's going 27 and 28. These are 139N, they go into 27 and 28. These are right next to each other, that makes that pretty easy. So for some reason, when you get these straight from the factory, the pins don't line up 100%, so you gotta kind of finesse them in there at first. So I usually use one side of the socket as a reference to kind of bend all the pins at once. And once you get that done, they go in pretty easily. Just got to make sure that you're centered on the pins inside of the socket, and you're good to go. All right, those two are done. This is a uh, 74ALS11AN. This one goes into U37. I feel like somebody's proposing to me. I get these nice little jeweler's boxes full of expensive chips. So where is U37? There she is. Let's mark that one done. Let's see what this is. Real-time clock. And this goes into U10. says this side up like that actually matters. And this is the clock that doesn't have the built-in battery, which is nice. And if you've never done this before, each of these chips has a little notch on it that matches up with that notch on the socket that we talked about earlier, that matches up with the notch on the board which indicates where pin one goes so it's not terribly hard to to do it right memory static ram 4m 2.7 to 5.5 volts 55 nanoseconds making sure the part number matches yep So this is supposed to be 512K of static RAM, 32 pin socket, 32 pin package. This goes in U11 and U12. So there's two of these, so that means this guy's got one meg of RAM. All right, we got those two in.
more 74 series logic. This is a 175N. Should be three of those. And they go into U24, 25, and 26. Five seventy threes, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen sockets. And there's fifteen. There is sixteen. You think it'd be right there, right next to it? Well, it was, kinda. These are 244s. They go in 22 and 23. Sometimes it's easier to pull the little pin out of the end of the chip sleeve, and sometimes it's easier just to pull the chips out of the other end. You never know until you get there. So I wonder what we're going to have to, what kind of tricks we're going to have to do to address the extra RAM. Go 
was in 38. That was one of the sockets that I had to remove and put back in. That socket's got a lot of love. Oh, flash ram. 128k of flash ram. And my wild guess as it goes there, and of course looking at the uh, parts diagram, shows that I am correct on that. I already made that mistake once putting stuff in based on a guess without looking. I learned that lesson. And you know what? I'm going to have to program that, so before I go too crazy with that, I'll put it back in its little holder. And I'll set this off to the side for when it comes time to program. Before I threw all that out, I should have read it. Good thing the chips are actually labeled. 670. This goes in 14. This is uh, 34 and 35. Goes into twenty nine. These are zero fours. And this goes into thirty nine. Tri-State Octobus. This is a 245. 18, 19, 20, and 21. There's four of these. I should read what it is before I do that. These are 20s. It goes into U36. Oh, and I did put that one in backwards. And you get these chip removal tools, got little hooks on the bottom of it. Take your time, wiggle it up and down so you don't bend any of the pins in the wrong directions. Alright, check to make sure that they're all in the right order. 
Okay, so there's a couple of tips missing still, which we need to order. And some of these uh, were not really available over at Mauser, so I gotta go out to eBay and get them. Um, some of them I haven't decided what I'm gonna do yet. The 8088 processor versus the uh, VIC-20. The VIC-20, that's for Commodore. The V-20 from NEC. And uh, some of these other sockets support that. As an example, your clock crystal down here, so it changes out depending on what speed of processor you put in. So I'm gonna order them up, and then we will put that into an upcoming video. I wanna thank you guys all for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe, and uh, check down below in the description for links to Sergey's uh, bill of materials and excellent documentation and a place to order the board from. Uh, Sergey's done a really good job on this board. I've talked about it a little bit. Um, some of the things that make this nice are that everything's all lined up. The silk screen indicates the part type. So C15, C for capacitor, 15 for capacitor number 15. And it says 0 0.1 microfarad on it. So you know, if you just grab the board, you could probably figure it all out. Having the bill of materials helps you with uh, ordering because it actually gives you Mauser part numbers and Tamiko part numbers and Unicorn Electronics part numbers for some of them. Um, it's the first time I've dug into something this complex. It's been fun so far. And uh, this is board number two in the series. There's still a couple of more boards to go. Let's see. This is a Super VGA adapter. So I'm going to have to do some surface mount work there. That's going to be a lot of fun. This is a compact compact flash card adapter. This is, what is this? Oh, this is an actual sound card. And then this is the floppy disk and serial controller, which I don't even have any floppy disk drives anymore. I got rid of all of that stuff thinking I would never need it again. And I think that's why all this stuff comes back into fashion online is because people who had this stuff when they were younger want to play with it again. So stay tuned for more. Thank you very much.